Do you remember the Pokemon game with unethical experimentation, evil corrupted Pokemon, and whatever the heck this is? No? Well, let me introduce you to Pokemon Void, one of the craziest Pokemon fan games. Our story begins in the Stranim region, where we're currently watching the finals of the Pokemon Championships. Just then, we hear that there's an incident at Lake Null, leaving multiple people missing and injured, which the Psycorp refuses to comment on. As we head downstairs, everything begins to shake, and another newsflash pops up that the western half of the region is under attack. Our father then bursts through the front door and apologizes as things go white. Two years later, we wake up in the same house that was presumably bombarded. Our father tells us that we're to meet a Mr. Pines at the train station in town. Outside, we meet a boy named Tyrone, who's also here to meet the professor. Once we greet the man, he tells us that ourselves, Tyrone, and his grandson Chad have been chosen to train Pokemon in order to inspire hope back in the people of this region. I decide to go with the Fire-type Bondcat, which only makes sense since we wear red and our rivals wear green and blue. Pines sends us off with a task to go to the Klonin building at Berylian City for our first true assignment. On our way there, we begin to encounter a lot of new fake bonds, catching a shiny Snow Yule, Eevee, Hundy, shiny Martini, and shiny Corvin. Once in Bergillion, we get a little Easter egg about Pokemon Uranium. A scientist named Lucille basically ruins the whole plot and then gives us a nuclear-looking Pokemon named Uranium. At the Klonin building, our father asks us to accompany him to the Uberforge to drop off some schematics. Then his assistant Lorelei tells us that just because he's the director of the Odin Corporation, we won't get special treatment. At the Forge, we learn a little more about the Stranim region. The people use items called Zauber Crystals to power up Pokémon and make weapons and technology. Apparently, these crystals are made from the same material as Kalos' ultimate weapon, which Lysander tried to use to destroy the world. Anyway, at the Botanical Garden, Lorelei gives us our first assignment, to clear the place out. After dodging some ghost types and restoring ventilation to the building, Lorelei tells us that to complete this assignment, we must beat her in battle. She leads a Snow Yule as I send out Corvin. Mach Punch one-shots the Ice Normal type, bringing in the Ghost Rock Soldier. I swap Hundy into a Rock Throw, but Protean changes the Ghost to a Normal type before our Crunch can hit. I go back to Corvin as the Switch Heavy AI brings in Ghastly. Lorelei continues to counter my Switch Ins until I can finally catch the Gen 1 -er with a Wing Attack. After fighting our way through Hypnosis turns, our Fighting Bird cleans up Solder with its Flying type move. Unfortunately, Lorelei pops a Revive on her Sentient Boulder as we take down Ghastly. After Corvin drops to Revenge, Tempest can come in and clean the battle up with a pair of Embers, earning us the Initiation Badge. Our Father's Assistant also gives us our next assignment go to Deuterio Settlement and find Commander Albert. Upon meeting the man, he gives us a mission to investigate an old bio lab at the end of the Route 4 swamp. On our way there, I add the shiny electric bug Galarva to the team over Martini. We catch up to Albert, who's confronted by two mysterious figures using some corrupted Pokemon. We're ambushed by one of these Triflies, and after defeating it, the commander says that they are back. He tells one of his recruits to get everyone ready for some kind of operation as the two of us continue on to the lab. We complete a puzzle designed around mixing different chemicals in order to create a solution to destroy this object blocking the stairway. It turns out this was a boss Pokemon, Divi Halo, who Tempest KOs with a pair of Fire Fangs while tanking Leech Life and Fairy Wind. Upstairs, we find containers of something called PBE, which is an energy source that the Odin Corporation uses in their research. With that, it's time to battle for our second badge as we jump in against Albert. He leads the fighting bug Armeedle as I send in its pre evolved form Beetle. I fake out then quick attack while getting hit by Struggle Bug, but on the third turn, we see a swap to Ravage as I go for the bug type move. After one more quick attack, I let Overcast go down to Aerial Ace and bring in Storm. Slash hits hard, but our Rough Skin plus Shockwave do decent damage before Armeedle comes back in on the next. Albert continues to switch and pop full restores, eventually taking Galarva down with another wing attack. Taking advantage of a switch in, Corvin wastes the commander's lead with wing attack and lands one on its evolution before being KO'd to the same. Tempest comes in next and uses a timely fire fang on a switch to Trifly who bug buzzes for big damage before being dropped. Ravage is finished by a pair of Mach Punches, but every boss trainer also has revives, so after one last Fire Fang to finish the reincarnated Armeedle, we finally finish our second assignment and earn the Soldier Badge and a Mega Ring. 
In the next town, we meet another commander, Zillia, terrorizing some kid with her shiny Steelix. She says that before she can give us our assignment, we need to find her beldum and bring it back to her. Also, if you couldn't tell already, this woman is absolutely insane. We find and return the pseudo-legendary while Zillia rambles about some missile she created with PBE, a metal coat catalyst, and rocket fuel. Unbeknownst to us, the reason this Pokemon ran away was because it knew she was about to use it as a navigation chip in this crazy experiment. She often gets put on probation by the Odin Corp for unethical experiments, and because of that, she tells us it's our job to press the button to launch this thing. We comply and watch as Zillia's creation absolutely destroys the ecosystem of the following route. She couldn't be happier with the outcome, and as we follow her south, we find that all the plant life has been turned into metal. Even the Scythers have all evolved into Scizors. We also finally get our first evolution of the game, with our starter reaching its second form, Oxalot. I then hatch an egg we were given earlier, revealing the Electric-type Kolob, who has the ability Speed Boost. Now it's time for the Zillia battle. She leads Martinder as I send out a corrupted Hundi I caught earlier. We get put to sleep by Grass Whistle, and for some reason the commander continues spamming the move before swapping to Matang. We survive a Metal Claw, then hit the Void move Burst, which is super effective against everything. Unfortunately, we draw too much energy to ourselves, and recoil damage knocks our lead out. Next, I go to Tempest, who firefangs the pseudo, and tanks one Metal Claw while Zillius spams full restores. We catch Martinder on a switch with the move, then swap Hurricane in on another Grass Whistle. When Matang comes back, I bring Oxalot in, who can tank another Metal Claw, then outspeed for a Firefang KO. Shiny Steelix is next, who we immediately burn with Will-O-Wisp as it sets up Stealth Rock. Our Flaming Chomp doesn't do much, but after a failed second Stealth Rock, we catch Martinder with our next. Although we're put to sleep on the following turn, we wake up to finish Steelix with a crit, then take down the lead and the Steel Snake again with more Fire Fangs. We're then given the Augmentation Badge, and it's time to hightail it out of here because Zillia might really blow us to bits. With a little more training, our Eevee now evolves into a new evolution, Feralion. We now catch up with Tyrone just in time to see the group that Zillia was harassing initiating some raid to reunify the region. We learn that these grunts are part of an organization called Team Runic, and in order to defend the dam that they're raiding, we need a Pokemon that can surf. On our way to Mr. Pine's house to get some help with this, Hurricane evolves into Ravage. The professor then tells us that he has a Pokemon outside that can help us and hopes he hasn't misplaced his trust in us like he has with Chad. With the ride Pokemon Swamper by our side, we finally arrive at the dam where Tyrone's mom works. While battling some runic grunts, Kolob evolves into the speedster Cheetark. We then reactivate the wind turbines that power this facility and confront one of the team runic commanders, Shield. Strangely, she says that their director has ordered them not to harm me specifically, but doesn't tell us why. She then pulls her team out, claiming that they have another raid to start and that they'll have control of the dam by the end of the day. Tyrone's mom, Shannon, then says she'll count this as our fourth assignment, so it's time to battle for another badge. She leads a Cheetark of her own, so my plan to go boom with this Swell Arc I caught goes up in smoke. Hurricane is then able to do some damage with Mach Punch and survive a Thunderbolt before Shannon switches in her own Water Mine. I happily let her waste full restores on this thing, then after doing a little more chip to Cheetark, I swap my own in on Thunderbolt. Quick Attack does basically nothing, but we catch Swellark on another switch to knock it out with Discharge. Salamember is next out who takes 50% from our Electric-type move and brings us low with Flame Burst. On the next, we see another swap to Cheetark, which gets a Lucky Para. The following attack just isn't enough to KO the Cheetah, so after going down to Crush Claw, I let Tempest get the finish with Mach Punch. We do surprisingly little damage to Salamember, so after a Mach Punch and a Fire Fang, I switch into Feralion, but the Water Fighting type Smashtapod comes out to meet us. Dizzy Punch confuses Delta, but she breaks through to charm the Lobster. Next turn, we shrug off Fire Punch and break through Confusion again to Swords Dance. On the switch, we snap out to drop Salamember with Covet, then even with a revive, we clean up the rest of this fight with Covet, Quick Attack, and one last Covet being handed the Engineer Badge. Just then, Shield returns, revealing that some of our guards were actually members of Team Runic in disguise. We managed to escape on Swampert for the time being, but we aren't sure if Shannon made it out okay. As we continue on, I catch some new team members, Bombardier and Club Ash. We then reconvene with Albert, who tells us that we'll be heading to the Null facility with another commander, Erica. 
but first we stumble upon a small cult called the Separatists. They want Uraim, so after handing the Pokémon over, they seem to achieve nuclear fission, blowing themselves off the face of the Earth in the process. Once inside the facility, we put on this protective suit and finally hear from the director for the first time. He says that very soon the Odin Corp will have to take drastic measures, but what exactly does he mean? Eventually, we make it to a room where our father is telling other scientists that he has a risky idea to get out of this bind. He's concerned for our well-being, but decides to proceed with his plan to shut down something he refers to as the containment field. He claims that if we activate the detonation sequence, then hopefully Team Runic will retreat. The team deactivates the field and we see gravity alter as we begin to float and everything goes white. With the field re-engaged, we come to and our father is thankful that we had the protective suit on. We then learn that Team Runic stole the Grishis Orb that the Odin Corp had in their possession, but our dad says as long as we still have the Adamant and Lustrous Orbs, our plan will continue as is. Hines then sends Eriko to West Stranim to get the Orb back, and our father brings us to a separate room to show us something. This dark mass is actually a gateway to another dimension that the Odin Corp refers to as the Void. It corrupts anything that comes into contact with it, and worst case, if something gets sucked in, you can never get it back. We then learn the true goal of the Odin Corporation is to find a way to destroy the Void, so that all those who have been negatively affected by it, including our mother, could be at peace. On our father's instruction, we return to Bergillion, where Lorelei tells us to investigate the sewers as our next assignment. We meet a man named Andreas here who tells us that he'd like us to power on some underground generators to help supply the city with electricity. While completing this assignment, our Club Ash evolves into its final form Smashtapod, and Rave Edge becomes the fairy fighting type Valcorvus. Now it's time to take on Andreas. He leads a Scolipede as I send out Tidal. I immediately go to Quake on a resisted Poison Fang, then tank Night Slash and fire off Bulldoze. A swap to Bulldor gives us free super effective damage into a Horn Leech as Stealth Rock goes up on our side. Another Horn Leech after a full restore gets us back to full, then our next Bulldoze brings Scolipede below half health. The ground type assault continues until a Horn Leech drops Bulldor and Andreas sends in an Aggron, immediately Mega Evolving and using Takedown as we beat Doze again. Since the Steel type has insane defense, I swap Tempest into a Mist Iron Tail, then Flamethrower to KO Scolipede on Switch. The Poison type Hexard is next, so it's back to Bombardier, who's hit by Confusion. A Clear Smog on the following turn does virtually nothing as we bring the pile of sewage low. Before we can get the KO, Agron comes back to eat Bulldoze, so I bring Oxalot back, who unfortunately gets dropped by Takedown on the Switching. Debris can now come in, bring the Mega Low with Discharge, eat Iron Head, and knock Hexart out on a switch. Of course Andreas uses a Revive as we finish Agron, but we outspeed and bury Scolipede one last time, earning ourselves the Surveyor Badge. On our way out of the Underground, we find a Miner on the brink of death, simply stating he couldn't stop him. Back at the Klonin building, we're given a new invention, the Void Ball, which can steal away a Void-affected Pokémon from a trainer. Hold on, haven't I seen this before? Anyway, we now advance to West Stranum to join the battle against Team Runic, but we're stopped by Tyrone. He said that the evil organization will spare his mother if he stops us from moving forward, but we waste him in battle, and he pleads with us one last time to take them down. After infiltrating their base, we run into S.H.I.E.L.D., who can't believe we haven't been caught yet. Against the director's wishes, she engages us in battle, but her team of Avalog, Valcorvis, and a new Pokemon, Panzerk, can't stop us. Interestingly, as she heads out, she says that the director has all of Odin Corp under his thumb. But who could he be? Our father then calls, furious that we left Bergillion, but our phone call gets cut short by a Golia mine that self-destructs. As we press on, I catch the Steel Flying Alaron and pick up its Mega Stone. We rendezvous with Erika again, who decides this is the perfect time to challenge us for our 6th badge. She leads Salamember, who doesn't even do damage to Debris before eventually being swapped out for the Poison Dark-type Rodeth. Two discharges come up short of a KO as Crunch plus Poison Touch knock our lead out. Tempest comes in and fires off a Flamethrower after Erika full restores her rat, then Salamember returns to the field on an ineffective Will-O-Wisp. I switch Tidal in on a Mist Inferno, then Mega Evolve and bulk up as we're trapped by Whirlpool. Rodeth comes back on a Bug Bite, then drops to Aqua Jet as the commander reveals her next Mon, Zwilus. 
We're outsped and hit hard by Dragon Pulse as Bug Bite does over half to the Dark Dragon. Aqua Jet does a lot less than I thought it would, but luckily the not very effective Crunch is used as our next Bug Bite Aqua Jet combo KO Salamander. Smashtapod is able to hang on through one more Crunch to KO Zwilus, bringing in the Dark type Uba Lord. Our priority Water type move does decent damage before Tidal is KO'd by a pair of Feint attacks, so I bring in Valcorvus. I get baited as I Dazzling Gleam into the Fire Grass type Immerate, who does way too much damage to Tempest with Lava Plume. After a second takes us down, Delta comes in and covets on a swap back to Uba Lord. I go to Hurricane again on a 4 times resisted Dark Pulse, then after foul play, we pick up the kill with Revenge. Our Fairy Fighting type drops to the revived Rodeth, but Quake is able to clean things up with a combination of Earthquakes and Mach Punch, earning us the Warrior Badge. As we move farther west, we encounter a Runic Juggernaut using a Void Corrupted Pokemon, Empyreon. Since this seems like a corrupted evolution, I obviously snag it away from him and make it my own, discovering that due to mutation, this is actually a Void-type Pokemon and it has huge power. We then see that Erika has been captured as we're confronted by a man named Schwert who uses a sword just like Albert. We take down his Divi Halo, Corvitsu, Bulkemoth, and Mega Alaron before realizing due to a short circuit that the man is a cyborg. Tempest also finally reaches his stage 2 form, Saber Torch, and gains the Dark Typing. After rescuing Erika, we're confronted by a man who claims to be on our side, even though we've never seen him before. He tells us he was instructed to keep us safe and lets us know that Team Runic has hijacked a cargo train that's on its way to Berylian. Erika asks if I agree with his plan for her to stop the train on her own while I go with him to retrieve the Grishis Orb. Although I say no, she decides the plan is best and the man introduces himself as Lugner, an undercover agent. On our way to the storage facility, where the Grishis Orb is presumably being held, we stumble upon a blue jacket holding a photo of someone's parents that we pick up. Inside the facility, we find a bunch of research notes detailing a test subject who experienced hallucinations and psychosis. What's even crazier is that exiting a door somehow doesn't lead to the same place we entered from. Lugner then questions if we trust our father and how much we really know about him and his plans. Eventually, we're confronted by a man I presume to be the director who says he can't let us leave here. He shows us an image of all our friends and allies being crushed by some giant monster, claiming that once he succeeds, he'll create a new regime without limitations to interfere with scientific research. We're then given the choice to join or reject the evil mastermind, obviously opting to fight for our friends that we've grown closer to throughout this journey. Before the man disappears, he warns us that he can't stop what happens next and hopes we can survive. We come to in a small room, then stumble upon Chad lamenting about always bringing others down. As he accepts his hopelessness and wishes to be strong, he transforms into some kind of demon. This sets off one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in a Pokemon game. You're forced to almost flawlessly run back the way you came and trigger two switches in order to unlock a door, all while being chased down by this monster. If it catches you, you're forced into a battle where it one-shots every one of your Pokemon and you spawn back in front of Chad having to attempt this all over again. Somehow I make it through and end up in a realm of light with a soul tower to enter. Inside, we find Lugner, who reveals that he's been working for Team Runic this whole time, forcing us into battle. We take him down fairly easily, to which he reveals that this isn't even the real him, disappearing into thin air. We then find Chad again, seemingly back to his old self, telling us he found a way out of here. We decide to trust him when he says to hold our breath until we black out, revealing that we were trapped in some kind of dream world. We then follow our rival through a portal to the distortion world where he seems to soften up a bit, even thanking us for bringing back his jacket. We traverse the Pokemon Underworld and make it back to Virgilion, where Andreas tells us that the city's under attack. We find Albert and Erica holding off some forces, but just then we see a shadowy figure similar to the monster Chad transformed into in the Dream World. The director says this is our last chance as the monster absolutely nukes the Klonin building and the commanders call for a full retreat. In all the commotion, we're given our 7th badge and ride the train back to our hometown where Albert gives us our next assignment, find Commander Eliora, one of the Odin Corp's earliest experiments. As we head north, we're confronted by somebody strange, urging us to continue up the mountain. 
After a gauntlet of ice puzzles, including one that's timed, we make it to the peak of the mountain where the strange figure is short-circuited by Schwert. We're then forced to battle the robot, revealing herself to be the missing commander Eliora. Her lead park owl gets a brave bird off before Sabretorch's Fire Fang one-shots it. Next is a Garchomp that Mega evolves, so I pivot through Alaron on Crunch to Hurricane on a Dragon Rush. She withdraws to Haxorus, who's hit hard by Dazzling Gleam, forcing the commander to waste her full restores before I land Revenge and Garchomp returns to get blasted by the Fairy-type move. After a 4 times resistant crunch, we drop the Mega with one more, bringing in the Fire Ice-type Fenris. And Pyreon unfortunately takes massive damage from an Ice Beam, getting outsped and KO'd on the following turn. I go to Tempest now, but my Fire Fang is met by a Haxorus swap. I switch Hurricane in on an ineffective Dragon Pulse, but am utterly shocked when the Gen 5 Dragon busts out Guillotine to Okomi. Thanks to Fenriz's Intimidate, Delta's Covet barely scratches the wolf, but I'm specially defensive enough to tank Aurora Beam and Swords Dance to get the plus one attack. Flamethrower brings us into the red as Covet looks to be a two-shot, but as I quick attack on the following turn, Haxorus comes back in to tank it. Hanging on with 2 HP, our evolution gets the kill, then drops the hail damage. Cheetark has enough speed and special attack to finish off Fenris, leaving the Cyborg with only Noivern. Naturally, a revive is used, but we can outlast the dragon with discharges, then defeat the reincarnated Mega Chomp with our Fighter Jet's Aero Blasts. Eliora now seems to reboot as she rewards us with the Apex Badge. At the main stronghold, we find Chad reprimanding Erika that she let the director slip past her, so we go with our rival to catch him. From this point forward, we're only allowed to bring three Pokemon, and it turns out to be a gauntlet of double battles against Odin Corp traders Lorelei and Zillia, Lugner, even Tyrone and his mother Shannon, and finally Shield and Schwert. As we approach the top of the tower, we see that the Void has now grown beyond the boundaries of the containment field. Albert realizes that Schwert is actually his brother, and as we leave him and Eliora to deal with the cyborg, we finally reach the peak where we find our father. In a shocking twist, it turns out our dad actually isn't the Team Runic director, but rather it's Chad's grandfather, Alois Pines. The professor was upset with our father for not adopting his plan of creating a Pokemon that could control the Void, instead trying to seal it. Pines then reveals that with the resources Team Runic has acquired, he's completed his goal, the same monster we've already seen twice throughout this story. He then uses the adamant, lustrous, and gracious orbs to summon the legendary Pokemon of the Sinnoh region, Dialga, Palkia, and Giratina. Given one last chance to join the Mad Scientist, we refuse as he sends our father and Chad somewhere else, triggering a showdown against his legendaries. Cheetark's Thunderbolt does solid damage to Palkia, who lands a Hydro Pump to one-shot us. Turbulence is able to finish the Master of Space with two Aero Blasts after tanking a Spatial Rend, then Origin Form Giratina comes in. The Ruler of the Underworld only hits a not very effective Shadow Claw before two Draco Meteors decimate it, but at minus four special attack, we can't do much to Dialga. After fainting to Hail Damage, Darkness misses his first Blitz, but hangs on through Aura Sphere to shred the Master of Time on the following turn. The Professor's creation now absorbs the Legendary Trio, and it's time for the final battle. Lucky for us, I've discovered Rivelagon's weakness, the Void Ball. That's right, we do some damage to this demon with Cheetark and Alaron, then chuck a ball, and Uno Reverse Pines' entire plan. Using the last of its strength, the Void Pokemon teleports itself and its master away, so I guess the game didn't expect anyone to actually try to catch it. Just when all seemed lost, the scientists noticed that the PBE canisters were full, so our father instructs them to fire a singularity beam at the expanding void. The tower crumbles under the immense power, and as our hat is seen floating in the ocean, the words, The End, flash on screen. You really thought we'd go out like that? We hear a voice that guides us back to the realm of the living, and our father tells us we've been out cold for a few days. We catch up with him and get a bit of background on the whole void situation. Two years ago, our dad and Alois Pines worked for an organization called the Psycorp. In a joint project with the Sinnoh region, they were trying to use the Creation Trio to make our world better. They pushed fate too far, and the consequence was the opening of the Gateway, stealing away Chad's parents, Tyrone's father, our mother, and many others. After this incident, Alois stepped down as director of Psycorp, and it became our dad's job to find a way to close the void, bringing us to this current moment. 
The only thing left to do now is travel to Mount Zahite, where the remaining commanders are recovering from the events that recently transpired. This is Pokemon Void's Elite Four, but honestly, between Empyreon and Rivelagon, I could easily beat all of them. After rematches with Albert, Andreas, Erika, and Eliora, who else would be fond at the top of the mountain but Chad, the pseudo-champion of the Stronim region? His team of Immerate, Mega Panzerk, Volteric, Espeon, Park Owl, and Velocitor are dealt with by my two evolutions and Void, finally settling the score between us once and for all. Chad admits defeat and decides that instead of pushing others away, he wants to try to be our friend. We choose to be the bigger man and accept his apology, putting an end to our adventure through the Stronim region. This game was really interesting to play through, and I definitely enjoyed the original fake mons and concept of corrupted mons. If you like fan games with original stories, I definitely recommend giving Pokemon Void a try. Also, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more like it. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.